Well, hello, everybody. What's new? What's next? What's now? You are in the right room. It is great to see you all. Terry Brown, how are you? I see you. Great to see you. Doug, I can see you. Jan, it was great. You know what? Jan and I were on a clubhouse call earlier today together, and um, we were talking about all kinds of crazy stuff. You need to join us. The I see Vincent's in the house. Who else is in the house? Hey, where are you coming in from? Because We've got members that are North America wide and some members across the pond. So throw in the chat where you're coming from. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever time span you are in. Don Rossum's in the house. Don is um, a Toastmaster prodigy. Isn't that right, Don? Good to see you, Christian. So we are really, really excited today you know that's a uh, jennifer you you chose a song that uh called courage and man is it a time when courage is needed we live in a world that seems to be constantly bombarded constantly changing and constantly very like it's challenging to figure out where we belong and how to respond and courage is often the antidote to dealing with such a world so you are in the right place um, Jennifer, why don't we get started? Let me just look in the chat here. Oh, we got people from Orangeville, Barrie, Vancouver, North Vancouver, Ottawa, Pennsylvania. Look at that, all over the place. It's awesome. Um, why don't we get started? Well, welcome, everybody. My name is Naran Kulathungam. I am the Chief Leadership Officer for Real Estate Wealth Lab. Most of you I have met or spoken to, and if I haven't, we need to connect. I'm here with Jennifer Hunt, our Chief Intelligence Officer, and we are excited to come to you today again to talk about real estate and analysis and what is actually going on in the market to help you see clearly. A uh, couple uh, housekeeping items now. I know that many of you have been with us uh, for a few months and you'll see this is a repeat, but because we have new members uh, coming in um, every meeting, I just need to go over this again. So bear with me. Legal disclaimer, take a screenshot. It means that you're responsible to do your own homework. Okay. A couple things. Do ask questions. Say hi. Connect with people. Engage. Share feedback. The only thing we ask you, other than the obvious, no, don't be rude, uh, don't solicit and don't sell. I think that goes without saying, and I'm looking through the room, and I don't think there's anybody I need to worry about for that today. Next, we've got, uh, just so you know, this uh, the whole conversation is being recorded, so if you have registered for this event, you have access to the recording. Let's look at uh, the agenda, that what we are doing today. Um, we are right now at the beginning of the event. After, um, after I have introduced uh, our team, you're going to find we will get right into next level uh, real estate intelligence, as we call it. What is happening in the world within Canada and the U.S.? Following that, we are actually going to, Jennifer is going to be leading and talking to all of us, which I'm excited about because I don't know anything about investing in Arizona. And I'm looking forward to it. So I want to know, if you're like me, is Arizona a good place to invest in? Is it a place to buy now or should I be really cautious and step away from it? That's the, that's the question that will get answered by the end of our time together today. And then we'll have our uh, concluding remarks at the end. Um, what's next, Jennifer? What's on our, well, let's look at our team. For our team, you know me, you know Jennifer. Richard Dolan is our chief growth officer. I believe he is traveling right now as we speak, and he will be joining us uh, uh, at another meeting. We have Ken Klinafticus. He is in the house. He is the operations dude. He can, uh, he, can he can take you from concept to execution and lay out the, the entire process. Vincent Sundar is our chief technology officer. He, as I often jokingly say, he builds us our Skynet. He's the guy who's building the matrix for real estate. Yen. Kaczorowski, this man is the marketing guru that gets our name, our content, our brand out, not just to you, but to the entire North American population. 
Rob is with us and he's our chief real estate strategist. This guy is hands-on real estate in the, in the trenches and at the same time uh, able to come up with all kinds of unique ways of seeing things. And of course, most of you will know Paige because she is the head of our customer experience. So if you don't like me, don't tell Paige. If you love me, send her an email. The, um, what is next for us? Well, this? Jennifer, let's, Jennifer, it's uh, great to have you. Why don't you come thank on in? Thank you. Yes. So wonderful to be here. Wonderful to meet all of you who are brand new. And in fact, um, I'd like to just take a moment to welcome Graham Wheaton, who just joined uh, the Real Estate Wealth Lab membership. So thank you. Round of applause. Welcome, Graham. Uh, we are delighted to have you here. So go ahead, Naran, and uh, take us through what the heck rule is anyway. And we won't be long, just a few slides, guys. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, rule for those of you who know, there's a couple things that we, or a number of things that we bring to you. We bring weekly reports. I mean, this is real time weekly reports. And you will notice even in our slides today, how current the information is. We bring expert commentary. We bring macro market trends to you, what's happening on the large scale, but then we also dive in deep to specific market analysis, to specific areas, to regions, to cities. We have regular live digital events and we have masterminds where we can connect with each other. There's a portal that you can access and there you will find all the stuff I spoke about and, um, uh, a bunch of calculators that will help you. For, for me, Jennifer, you know what the calculators do? It's not just analysis. It provides for me a template to put in all my numbers so that I can present to a joint venture partner something that looks a little bit snazzier than just an Excel spreadsheet. Oh, isn't that the case? Because you and I and most of Next Level Investors, we already have our spreadsheets. We all are into our analysis and the ways that we've got to, to our, our minds to wrap our heads around deals. But that's not necessarily the best way to present to other people how they can see that information in a far more elegant way. <laughs> that's what I use them for, too. Absolutely. Great. Um, all right. Next slide, then. Okay. Live Why don't you take us through? Um, so we do have live digital events, and these are three events a month. So that's on every Wednesday except for the first Wednesday of the month, so the second, third, and fourth. Now, the Market Leaders Lab, you might ask what that is. That is where we have someone who's incredibly, wow, doing extremely well in real estate. Now, you might not know it at first, for example, like we had recently David Falk, who was Michael Jordan's sport, sports agent. And you might go, why is that a connection with real estate? Oh, because he invests in real estate. And he had some incredible gems for us uh, following that, that smart money. So that was very cool. Um, at our community lab event, what we do there is, well, we get a little bit more personal getting to know each other, networking, asking questions, um, going really a lot deeper hands on with materials as well. And then at the research lab, you are here right now. Uh, this is really about research current events and current indicators that impact your real estate and a continuous look at where we are in the real estate cycle formula. Perfect. And if you are excited about what we're doing and you would like to represent the cause so to speak become a rule ambassador register and what this happens is that we will give you a specialized link that will allow you to share it with your family with your friends and what that means is that when they if they should sign up and when they sign up with us we'll make sure that you are credited for that Awesome. And um, in order to sign up, I think you just need to, uh, and Alex, maybe you can pop it in the chat, email info, I think, at realestatewealthlab.com, and we'll get you all set up with your own custom link. And there we are. And invite and, your friends. <laughs> yes, and in, invite your friends. So, Jennifer, I think we are ready to keep moving on this, are we not? Yeah. This is how you can get, get in touch with us. And I guess it's time to get right into the research lab. And, and before we get there, Jennifer, one thing I want to mention to, uh, to people is that if you are taking a screenshot of something or you want to 
put something out on social media, just tag us, please. That would be awesome. Oh, that's a great suggestion. Thank you. Yeah, that sounds good. Okay, so um, we're going to do something a little different at today's research lab. So um, <laughs> get ready. I love that so many of you have your videos on. I appreciate it. And it's great to see Don, Natalia. Hey, Dad, Christian, Rick, Hugh. Oh, Hugh and Barry. So great. Uh, Jan, Pennsylvania. Great to see you. Doug. Oh, my gosh. There's lots of folks on. Love that you're and Daniel De Rossier. Um, having your cameras on because um, I'd like to see your faces when we talk about some of the stuff that we've got going on today. This is breaking news stuff. Um, and so um, we will uh, we'll be engaging you in questions and thoughts and discussions. Not to spend a lot of time on it, but you'll see what I mean when I get there. So for those of you who have just joined, welcome Graham for again. Um, the real estate cycle is simply the business cycle of real estate. And what we need to do is understand the duration of it and when to be selling, when to be buying, when to be holding, and to ultimately prepare ourselves for the ultimate success. And our, um, pri uh, I guess, proprietary formula of the real estate cycle formula really allows us to um, drill into that duration. And that's really what we talk about today is the indicators that go into that. Um, so what it looks like uh, is a little bit like this as well, is that GDP, jobs, people, and a number of other leading leading indicators um, actually move and um, influence the rental market as well as the property market about two years later. One year for the rental market, two years for the real estate market, but it's not always just two years. It can be up to seven years. It can be 10 years. And that's that accordion, if you will, of what levers are in play right now having a weighted impact that will be able to help us more accurately showcase how long a cycle will be. And that is very exciting. And that's what we're gonna get into. But what are we talking about? Uh, we're kind of talking about some media and why do we question what we see in the media? And I love this um, because we, uh, this is a little cartoon of all these amazing journalists. They just get out of journalist school and it's like be the, you know, the principles and journalistic principles and ambassadors to truth and voices to the voiceless and all these heroic, wonderful components. And then you see these kinds of headlines. I won't even repeat that, but checking out these actual watermelons and having clickbait and things like this litter of fruit watermelons here. So those are the kinds of things that why I'm passionate about this and why I'm particularly passage, uh, passionate about um, research for real estate investors is that um, I've been doing this a long time. I have my master's degree in sensationalism and news and how it impacts democracy. And I have been told by a number of professors, but this one in particular was on my thesis that it was my first draft and I didn't have to even submit a second draft of my master's thesis. And he says, this is Dr. Gill Wilkes, thank you very much. Uh, please continue to perform, perform research because you're really, really good at it. I appreciate those words because they inspire me every day to do my best and deliver my best to you um, because it's important. We've got things that are happening and they affect our real estate. So here's a, this is my ambitions is to create, uh, to uh, advise truth and show um, what's going on in democracy. So today we are going to start the research lab with political climate in Canada, because <sighs> there's a lot going on. And I want to begin by saying that we started talking about emergency acts, emergency planning acts at the provincial level in September, 2021. And during those, we I actually, we, they're, they're in the member portal, so you can go back and look at the presentations. And I actually, there's pictures of what those measures look like. And we started dissecting, you know, property rights, appropriation, what does that look like? We got legal consultation, you may recall, on what to do if that were to happen. And a lot of questions that next level investors and the members of this community were asking were how concerned should I be and what should I do? And do I put my foot on the gas or do I put my foot on the brake when it comes to my real estate portfolio? And so we're really having an extension of that conversation today. Before we get into it, I do want to just provide, remind you again of the legal opinion to the response. If you're ever in such a position, please take a screen grab. This is from the COVID Care Alliance. Of, and I don't, I'm not a lawyer. <laughs> so, and I, I don't know that, but this is what we received um, 
of the two key phrases that you could potentially put forth if you were ever so in a situation is that I simply, apparently, I do not consent to your jurisdiction um, and we have no need for your services here, officer. This is a private matter. So there you have it. Just reminding you of that was information that we got from um, legal consult. But now where we are today, we're at the National Emergency Measure, Measures Act. Um, and this was, here's a quick timeline, February 14th, invoked by the Prime Minister, February 21st, passed in the House of Commons, February 22nd, debated in Senate, and three hours ago on February 23rd, revoked by the Prime Minister. I'm going to share why this matters. But first, this is not about me. <laughs> I just want to be super clear. And this is not about you. This has nothing to do with your personal opinions of the situation, of whether it's right or wrong. What we wanna do is unpack what the perceptions are and if and how it may affect your real estate values. That's it. So um, I know that it can be a very divisive subject. It's been certainly all over the news, et cetera, et cetera. But I really wanna, I wanna admit and say that I care about each and every one of you. I value your opinions. We can ha certainly have conversations and discourse at any time, um, but this is, and we're going to do that in this little section as well. So the first question is, could the Emergency Act be good for real estate? All right, so here's the premise, martial law or the emergency, I should say EMA, I guess it's faster. So is the EMA is excellent for real estate investors. Okay, so then the questions are, you know, does typically government or military action inspire people to want to go visit a country, invest in a country, etc. These are just questions. Does government and military action increase or decrease economic activity historically? Does government and military action increase or decrease currency values? And it really depends. The answer is it depends. What do you think in this case? And why do I say it depends? I'm going to unpack this a little bit more deeply, but it really isn't about it, it can be really seen as a positive thing. I mean, there's certainly locations where, you know, there's been an insurrection or whatever have you, and having this kind of government and military action come in and, and stop it can be very, very powerful and actually improve situations. So it can be excellent for real estate investors. And that ultimately it's really a matter of perception. So why this is really confusing is because people have a different perception of it. So what we have to do is kind of unpack the narrative of what's the majority uh, perception of what's going on. So currently this is as of yesterday um, and the day before. So I have not gone and done a litmus test in the three hours since the changes of what, what was going on out there. But at the moment, the, the, the general consensus, even from, and this is the thing, from other, from all, a whole range of media, and it was simply showing that it's not so favorable for the moment. Some of the headlines are, are pretty like, you know, in terms of destructive or, uh, you know, this, this one down here says tyranny, et cetera, et cetera. However, what happened is even with the, the outlets, media outlets that would typically be supportive they didn't come out and say yeah we support this go canada there was never that narrative i haven't seen it anyway and I'm, I'm totally i can be wrong but i haven't seen that so as a result the the tendency the flavor if you will was a little bit more on the negative side a little bit cautious and certainly if it wasn't cautious it was very more neutral so for example, like even CNN, Canada looks to end COVID-19 protests with tougher financial measures after another weekend of arrest. That's not positive support. It's just kind of more of a statement. So these are the kinds of things that we need to start thinking about as real estate investors. And don't worry, I'll get there. So then we wanna ask the question, could the emergency act be bad for real estate? Okay, so I mean, go back in history, and I, again, I am not a historian, I am whatnot, but there's things to look at. Are there economic indicators? Are they typically um, impacted positively or negatively of those things? Now, um, uh, you might want to consider, you know, people may wait in terms of immigration, that can be typically negative impact and negatively impacted for the short term at least. While the emergency use acts, think, you know, in other locations, people don't typically go running there to go and visit or to go and, you know, buy a house or immigrate or whatever. They're going to wait until at least 
ha, ah, there's some stability, things are, they know where things are going. So it's going to impact that, even if it's been revoked. And this is where we're going to go next, I think. Currency will fall. Um, the Canadian dollar has dropped dramatically in the last couple of days. Um, we'll see where it is tonight. Um, but there's also the lurking and looming questions, if you will. Like what, how much broader are they? There's certainly been, con you know, discussions about putting things permanently in place. Um, and there's banking instability and they are, you know, stocks of banks have dropped dramatically um, because of that instability. Then we want to consider it from our real estate hats is if the banks aren't doing well, that's a key component of where we get our mortgages. So, you know, how does financing and access to financing get affected and mortgages affected? Um, and then if we go even another layer, okay, so if let's say individuals, you know, have economically are, are impacted, then is there more reliance on government? Do then we need to have more considerations for who pays rent and how much and is it government? So then um, I've, took a stand and said, you know what, for real estate investors, I believe my portfolio and yours, I believe that given what is out there in the world currently, that the negative perception of having the um, Emergency Measures Act and the military coming out in a big way is not good for real estate investors. So uh, 283 emails um, to our government representatives on behalf of our real estate assets and our property values. That was simply my um, my goal and my intention. Um, so now what's next? So Senate, it's, it's before Senate um, goes to vote there and then the governor general could weigh in and then it goes to court. So that's kind of the, the, the timeline. Um, I wanted to share that this was um, available. I watched it, I was watching the Senate debates um, and it was very interesting um, I don't know where it landed. I was actually trying to get a tally, a full tally last night of who was uh, voting what. Um, I know I've got a couple of folks who are working on that out there. And um, yeah, so watching it live, watching it to see what's going on. This is important. And I do have the source at the bottom. It's a Canada Department of Justice. And this is the, the actual process of how, um, how it goes. So um, I don't need to go through all of it. I just want you to have it there for your reference and ease of reference if you need it of what the steps are. So where are we now? I have a series of questions um, that I'm going to walk us through. And the where I think that Canada needs to really be considering this and us as real estate investors with, again, that perception is why did politicians not meet with or talk with the truckers? Why did they not use existing laws and resources to proactively and reasonably de-escalate the scenario to where it got to this position? I'm genuinely confused and, and concerned. The country of truth and reconciliation, of diplomacy, of respect, and we did not have those kinds of uh, talks at all throughout this. And I think that that's important because again, it's not about my perception. It's about what is the perception of those outside of Canada and how that affects funding, trade, our economy, etc. So moving in, um, yes, the um, so it has been revoked. It was revoked this afternoon. Now, is that good or is that bad? I don't know. I really don't know. What authority, and this is where I'm very, I'm very curious, these are the questions, and feel free to pop it in the, in the chat there of, you know, if you are, oh, hey, Spring, yeah, exactly. Very interesting, because there's parts of it. Okay, all right, pop it in the chat. And yes, Christian, it was, it was revoked this afternoon. But what authority does the Prime Minister have to revoke the act? I literally don't know. So I, again, I am not a Canadian political science major. There may be some rule, but I'm just curious, can a minority Prime Minister make that decision? Um, if the House of Commons voted for it, I don't know, but Canadian government processes allow for this. In corporate governance, what I do know is that one needs a majority vote to invoke and to revoke. So I'm just curious if someone knows, like leader of a cabinet or whatever, that there's, there, I don't know the answer to this, but these are the questions that I certainly want to have answered and I have been asking them. Um, 
Thank you, Jan. Yeah, I know. I didn't, I did not want to talk about this. I was actually not. And then I realized, wait, this is exactly what the Real Estate Wealth Lab is for. So we do need to be protecting our real estate assets. And so regardless, let's assume that the prime minister does have the necessary govern, due, due diligent, no, sorry, due process uh, to be able to revoke it without a vote. Cool. So let's assume that. So regardless of the answers to that question, um, in your view, based on what you've seen so far, how does the invocation and revocation impact Canada's international reputation? What do you think? Has it helped or harmed? And harm, okay? Pop it in the chat or honestly, feel free to have a conversation. This is important. So harm, harm, okay. Seriously harmed. Okay. All right. Thank you. I appreciate. I'm just curious because there we are. Okay. So a couple of more questions. Um, how will this affect the confidence in Canada's stability? Hmm. Okay. Maureen, perfect. Help. Great. Thank you for sharing. Got it. And I, I think that this is really cool because it is possible, you know, like, okay, there are certain in, uh, folks out there who would say that, okay, no, this is, this is a way of seeing the world that, again, it's all about perception of that this is creating stability, 100%. So again, there is no, I truly, there is no, there is no right. <laughs> this is where we need to collaborate and just be following democratic processes. And that's kind of all we've got, regardless of our opinions. So how will investors and potential immigrants view this? Some may decide that they want to come to Canada even more because it, they feel that it's helped our, our, our um, viewpoint and our stability. And others will say, you know what? I'm not quite ready. I'm actually gonna pull out. This is, I feel like this is harm. So again, these are just the questions. Um, uh, are too, most immigrants in Mark um, thinks our laws are too soft. Right, right, okay. So there you go. That could be seen as, ha, ah, finally Canada takes on some action. Yeah, now I want to come. So that's possible. Patrick, I expect the PM read the tea leaves in the Senate and thought it would not pass there, so revoked it. Very good. That's an absolute possibility. Again, I have not tallied up the, the Senate votes, although I was starting to do that. But regardless, I'm just curious, does that help or hinder? Making sure that we go through all of our due processes. Um, and uh, how does the invocation and revocation impact Canada's real estate business? Helped or harmed? Hmm, okay. Maureen, the War Measures Act, uh, the predecessor to the Emergency Act, yep, exactly, was invoked in the 70s and did not cause long lasting effects. Perfect, exactly. These are the kinds of things that we want to be thinking of. Um, Catherine, global opinions of news media feel Canada has no leadership and its leader is weak. Yep, there's certainly some short term harm, longer term help, Hugh. Well done, okay. So how does the invocation and revocation impact Canada's real estate business? There you go. Short, that's a that's a, that's very quick. So a little bit of harm in the initial and now, okay, longer term, this will help. All of these answers are completely right. <laughs> Everything you say right now is, is completely right. And the final question I have for you is, how do you feel? And genuinely, I'd like to know the answer. Concerned. Confused, frustrated. Thank you, Anita. Catherine, I was International Margarita Day yesterday, so happy to be in Mexico. I hope you got a margarita in Mexico yesterday. Uh, Ryan, yeah, okay. Concerns about the um, leadership, if you will. Tell us how you're feeling. Embarrassed. And every cloud has a silver lining. Yes, there are opportunities. Yeah, Christian bothered that the feds in the city government were asleep at the wheel and unable to manage this. This was certainly something that was a long, like there was a long lead up to this, certainly. 
uh, and and you start, talk D Duncan and Leanne about thinking about leaving the country, and that's exactly like one way or another, helped or harmed. There has been a change in Canada's position. There has been a change. Now, whether it, those effects are long lasting or they are short term, something has shifted dramatically in those and that will impact our real estate because we're either going to have people leaving the country or fewer people coming in or just a shift. And maybe some people decide that they really wanna come in because of this. So we don't know, um, I'll move along, but I, I hope you trusted um, that this is a topic that needs to be discussed and ultimately, the general conclusions of Canada's Emergency Act and real estate, I would say, is that regardless of the invocation and revocation, the entire situation is unfavorable for real estate investors, businesses, rental and property markets for the time being. We, it has sent a precedent for invoking and revoking. Okay, so that means, you know, that there could be something that could come again. Our stability of our nation and our democratic processes and our identity as communicators <laughs> and polite, respectful communicators has been tarnished. Um, it's certainly been called into question, no matter which way you look at that. Um, and um, I would, for, for me, would want to see a little bit more stability and a view of the actual impact about this uh, before going on a real estate buying spree. That's all. That's just that is me, my personal opinion, because I want to see how this unfolds a little bit. That does not mean that that's the answer for you. So, um, but it will impact real estate in one way, shape, or another. And it may be just infinitesimal. It just might be a tiny, tiny component. But in other words, this is something that we definitely need to be keeping our eyes on. And please stay tuned because I will be watching this situation and how it impacts us as real estate investors very, very, very closely. So thank you all. I'm glad, um, Lewis, that you found that this was an excellent topic. Wow, our country. So that is why I chose Courage uh, by the Tragically Hip as our opening song, because we all need a little courage and a little compassion. And that song is actually written, it's called he, uh, Courage for Hugh McLennan. And he's an author and it's about Canadian society being free. So, um, free and and having a good society so there we are that's all i got on that Jennifer, topic yes i'm going to come in on this just for a minute sure um you know it's it's really interesting to me the responses that came up in the chat because it is really a picture of how i think that canadians are feeling there is at the end of the day regardless of what your political bent is and what your your opinion is at the end of the day, there seems to be an, a growing majority of people who feel confused, who feel uh, conflicted. And most of all, people feel like they have lost. There, there, there is a, uh, a lack of a decrease in the level of confidence in the leadership that surrounds us. If anything, the last two years have taught us is that leadership that we expected to be strong does not always behave in a strong manner in a in a well-rounded manner and as a result people i believe have lost their 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 faith in the powers that that govern us given that jennifer i think there's a great opportunity for us as real estate investors, and more importantly, as leaders within our own, own sphere. Yes. Here's what I find, that when confidence is lost, people look for safety. And, and when people look for safety on the, in the money game, when confidence is lost, money starts looking for safety. And when you show up as a person who can have conversations, not just about how to make a, a property cash flow, but you can locate that conversation inside of the overall worldview and activity that is going on, you start to separate yourself from every other real estate investor. So those of you in this room, you're looking to joint venture, you're looking to partner, to grow your portfolio, to be next level. These are the conversations that lead to capital coming to you, not because 
not necessarily because you have a better process, but because you speak the language and address the pain and confusion that is already present in the community. So as, as the leadership officer, I just had to throw that in. I'm so I'm so glad you did, Naran, and thank you for regrounding us in that. I very much appreciate it. And if I may, I'd like to actually just address Mark Amiel. You ask a very, very good question, and it's very important. Like looking at this as a negative scenario, what could be the actual impact on real estate? And I love it. Like these are the exact questions. Like, could it, how much could it reduce immigration by? And let's say you put out a scenario of let's say it's 10%, we would still have strong demand and low supply. A hundred percent. Canada has a very incredibly sh short short supply, so it it may not affect the real estate world much at all. However, I'm going to go back and remind us of those first two slides back when we were talking about the Provincial Emergency Planning Act um, in terms of rights and property rights and appropriation and things like this. I don't know. Um, also, as Naran eloquently mentioned, hmm, where there isn't stability or certainly there isn't a perception of the right action, there, there you go, money doesn't flow there. And that means that it could impact our economy, it could impact jobs, I don't know, Mark, but um, it wouldn't just be that 10% immigration necessarily, right? So what are all those other indicators that come into play? And so again, these are early days, it may not affect real estate at all, but we definitely need to be asking these questions because political climate is one of those things that just like, wow, overarching all of our indicators and can wham bam affect anything at any time. So I just wanted to let you know that we're going to be watching this very, very closely to see if it does and how it impacts it. Um, and yeah, Hugh, history has shown that real estate is a rock in both good and bad times. And that is the theme of the rest of today's presentation. So thank you, Hugh. So GDP, I'm going to get into all of, uh, go back into the regular format, if you will, but that's a political kind of overarching theme that's going on. Um, we're going to talk about GDP, jobs, population for US and Canada, and then the rental and property markets. And then we're going to get into that market analysis for Phoenix. So buckle up, ladies and gentlemen. All right. Um, can Biden, so we're going to switch gears a little bit, talk about the U.S. So can Biden flaunt the strongest growth in four decades? Uh, this is interesting. So basically we're seeing recovering GDP after a massive crisis um, is not growth. Hmm. Um, it's growth, but it's not like, it's. We're, this is why we talk about the net, and I'll talk about that in a second. We talk about net GDP at the Real Estate Wealth Lab. 2020 and 2021 saw the largest increase in federal debt in decades. So that's interesting. And real wages plummet. Consumers suffering while small, medium enterprises, SMEs, are seeing declining margins. Mm -hmm. So we 100% agree that growth rates must be reviewed in context. And this is why we do focus on net GDP, heavily on net GDP. It's not always available, um, but it is a more accurate picture. Um, and we have seen the devaluing of currency by printing money and circulating money um, which has created inflation, and these are headwinds to an actual recovery, full stop. That's just a, that's a major headwind. Um, and real estate, back to you, <laughs> exactly. Real estate is one of the best assets that typically outpaces inflation, and it does typically performs well in um, both good times and bad. So we do stand by our expectation of a very long, modest stabilization and expansion period all the way ahead with potentially a small softening for the economic re recovery due to uh, inflation to cur curtail that and to, re to reverse inflation and then also potentially a slight softening depending on uh, immigration patterns um, that we're seeing in 2020 and 2021 so that would be sort of in the 2023 2024 but other than that it's looking like a very positive long um, uptick for about 10 years um we, oh dad <laughs> dad what are you saying because of the shortage of supply the economy has to fail a lot before the real estate market will see the results slows the growth in price but a long time to reverse the effects on real estate very well said okay yes exactly so it will it real estate's a good place to be um so then another um forecaster sees slower growth in the first quarter so this is again u.s gdp they basically um put downward revisions on their GDP as well as their employment uh, objectives. So they went from um, 
it was supposed to be 3.9% growth, and it's been downgraded to 1.8% growth in 2022, Q1. However, if you look at Q2, Q3, it starts sort of really normalized for the end of the year. So a little bit of a drop overall, but uh, kind of making up a little bit of it in Q2 at the moment. This is just based on the Federal Reserve Bank um, and some other individuals, actually. Um, so here's another data set in terms of mean probabilities for real GDP growth in 2022. So I went, oh yeah, because this was a survey of a, a bunch of uh, forecasters. Oh, it's really good. It's, and now I'm, I'm remembering the exact article. Like, definitely check it out in your in your weekly uh, newsletter, real estate intelligence newsletter. It was really fascinating. And this whole mean probabilities is like, okay, so here's the current one is the blue, and the previous is the red. That's great. So most are saying that they're thinking sort of that two point five to three point nine growth um, for twenty twenty two. But notice that there's still some outliers. So that's interesting. So this is what I love getting into, like the actual um, biases of various ec economic uh, individuals and forecasters. Um, so I just found, found that fascinating, quite frankly. So better dwelling. Um, now we're switching to Canada's GDP. The Bank of Canada also quietly revised its GDP forecast to show a larger housing contraction. So they're showing that housing is actually gonna be a big drag on GDP in 2022 which is interesting because um, uh, housing is a major component of Canada's GDP. So um, they're suggesting though that annualized quarterly GDP reached 5.4% growth for Q3 2021, which is a substantial increase. And it would have been even higher if housing didn't drag the growth lower. So here's what they're saying. Okay, so they're showing that the economy showed some strong momentum heading into 2022. Uh, this yellow here is what they're showing for the housing, which is sort of at uh, the right scale. And then they're showing that it's going to be a lesser per percentage um, of the economy, and it's going to be dragging our GDP down. So what, uh, what do I think about that? This is what I think about that. I said, wait and see. <laughs> I think that the Bank of Canada was probably overly bullish in their initial forecast. And just like we just saw these other forecasters just downgraded, downward revisions, and that's really okay. I'm like, the housing is not about to like fall off a cliff. It's not about to not be a major component of Canadian GDP. So we still forecast housing to be a major factor in our economy and in Canadians' lives and budgets. So the housing market is still poised for long-term growth and expansion. I am really not concerned about this particular adjustment. Uh, we will be watching other forecasts closely. Um, and then this one is fantastic. It is uh, Canada's economy peaked way before the pandemic when measured per capita. So you'll recall just moments ago, I said that we really like to look at GDP at net. So the actual amount, is it improving? Because it's usually a percentage of growth. So is it, did it improve enough to actually be growth or is it just sort of like false growth because we're still underperforming? That's what I mean by that, the net GDP. So another way to look at GDP is not just the regular old real GDP. We gotta get some context and this is per capita GDP. So um, they're showing that Q3 2021 real GDP was um, one, up 1.3%, 3.4%, whereas per capita GDP quarter over quarter was up only 1.09%. What the heck does that mean? <laughs> so really, it means that according to this study, nearly one fifth of growth was due to the population, not the productivity. In other words, and this is a really cool graph, um, and I'll go into it in a little bit more detail, but we wanna be watching this red line. The red line is real GDP and per capita GDP is the blue line. And when the blue line is above the red line, essentially that means that we're being pretty productive. We're not relying on our GDP to be um, uh, based on population only. And so what's happened is that real GDP has gone above our per capita GDP, and that's where we start getting into less of productivity. So the conclusion is it's still growth. So there we are. Canada's GDP is still growing. It's just a little bit less growth. But it is important to look at what that means. So population, not productivity, is leading GDP growth. So that means that there's room for improvement in our economy. It's nothing to be overly concerned about right now. 
if this continues as a trend, however, it would be um, something to, to better understand um, in terms of our economic activity and productivity. Um, and so again, this is why we look at net GDP and we have never accepted at face value and certainly not from one source, looking at multiple sources with their biases in mind, we've never accepted the GDP, which is quote unquote, a vanity metric, um, according to other sources at face value. Uh, it is a leading indicator for rental and property markets. So we want to have as accurate a possibility as we can see so that we can forecast our rental and property um, markets one to two years down the road. And that's a general rule of thumb. However, things like political climate, for example, um, immigration, things like this can make that duration uh, either shorter or longer. And that's what we've got for you when we do our city specific analyses. So another sign of an incredibly long, slow, modest expansionary phase in real estate for the foreseeable future. So all things are good for um, a GDP for both the US and Canada, but you'll see that they're very, like, I, I can't even, I can't even get that arrow on the blue there to go down just a little bit, but regardless, it's, it's in the right direction. And that is definitely good news. So jobs, we're going to start with um, Canada, our January 2022 stats can uh, data. Um, interesting that January 2022 participation rate is higher than January 2021, just by a slight little bit. But here's where I really um, think is helpful. Um, here. So the Canadian economy, pretty much job market, I should say, uh, at our real estate wealth lab research lab last January, we went into this like in a lot of detail. Uh, but essentially, we reached our pre-pandemic job market. Like that pretty much has been gone through. If you haven't seen that presentation, I highly recommend it. Um, not for my benefit, but for yours, because it was interesting. Um, and we saw some cool data on, on jobs. We are seeing that slightly trending down month over month, which is interesting, but I like that this table really starts to show where we were in December 2019, which is our labor force our, and our employment rate and our participation rate, of course, but the labor force was 20,248. And in January 2022, so pre full pre-pandemic to now, January 2022, our labor force is 20,517. Our employment rate, I mean, 60 0.8% versus 61.8%. That's pretty close. It's only 1% difference. And I mean, actually by numbers, that would be probably about the same because we've gone up in terms of our labor force. Uh, there you go, size wise. And then participation rate also 65% compared to 65.5% back in December. So this is, again, a slight, slight monthly uh, downward trend not too concerned about that because all in all go canada we've, we've hit it with the job market um so i haven't seen any of those headlines about the labor shortages have anybody seen any of those lately i wonder where that narrative went huh i really haven't i'm being just very genuine if anyone has seen anything about labor shortages recently i'd be very curious i have not um okay well anyway uh, U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics, so moving into the U.S. economic news release, um, the state job openings and labor turnover summary, basically this particular release, and it's in your newsletter, which will be out today, um, and it has all of the job openings, hires, separations. It was done on a DOS computer, for sure, from like a Commodore 64 or something. Uh, it is not a pretty picture uh, in terms of like how it's put together uh, is funny it's really funny but it's got some information in it if that's where you're wanting to i did not put the graphs on here because they, they would blow your mind i should have because <laughs> they would blow your mind so anyway the conclusion is that there is not much change between november and december there is growth though that's good and meaning that real estate will expand as well and here's some of the various numbers so if you don't want to go back and look at that release uh, you don't have to. Um, so similarly, again, with the sort of jobs pretty flat, not a whole bunch of growth, but but certainly it is growth. So 
it's uh, it's just modest. It's just slow. Um, so there we are. Um, I'm just reading Catherine how accurate the labor stats are when people lost employment due to mandates are not being counted in the unemployment. Oh, I don't know that for sure. That's interesting. I'd be curious if they're not being counted. Oh, because of they wouldn't be in the unemployment data because of the way that they were classified. Is that what I'm hearing? Huh. Interesting. I don't know. Huh. So people, now we're moving into another leading indicator, which is always so important. And we're starting with America, the states. Americans are leaving and where they're headed. Uh, so this is very similar in, um, we have the U-Haul report, both in, U in Canada and the US, which shows where people are moving. United Van Lines does their own study, and this is their 45th annual. Um, and work was still the number one reason why people moved. However, the shift, this is important. The shift is while while it's number one, work is number one, a new migration trend has occurred. And that is that people want to live closer to their family. And that is in part influenced by the restrictions. People want to be able to be close to family. So that's now at 32%. Now, I love it. So where are they headed? Where are they going? So Cotton Eye Joe, anyone? Do you remember that? Where did you come from? Where did you go? <laughs> okay, so why do I sing like this crazy girl here? Because this is important. It's an opportunity versus a risk. So this is a cool study that tells you, okay, where did you come from? You've got your inbound, people are coming here, cool. But also your outbound, where are they going? So where did you come from and where did you go? Because you wanna know one is risk and one is opportunity. So I'm only showing here the inbound moves um, and Arizona is highlighted. And yes, you will see that there are doubles like 18, 18, 10, 10, 10, and some threes. Those are ties. It's not a typo. So just so you know that. Um, but yeah, so here's some of the, like the number one inbound moves, Vermont. Okay. If you're thinking about investing in Vermont, you'll want to check that out. I don't know the other factors, but that we could maybe do a market analysis on that. Why are people moving to Vermont? Um, South Dakota, South Carolina, Florida, number five, uh, Idaho. I mean, Boise, Idaho is the highest ranked real estate in the U.S. And uh, they have great fries, which I appreciate. Um, <laughs> Boise, Idaho fry company. Fantastic. Um, and Arizona. So Arizona is 18, 54%. Uh, percent. So we're gonna talk about Arizona a little bit. That's why that one's highlighted. Um, Cause you can see that there's trends that happen. Uh, so the US president's economic strategy explodes public opposition to migration. What? Okay, this is interesting. Uh, I don't need to, I think I should probably go to the next slide. It'll be probably easier to say, but 9% of Americans want, only 9% of Americans want more immigration. 35% want less immigration. Um, now, <laughs> this is according to a Gallup poll of 811 adults. So what, like does 811 adults actually really constitute like a fairly sizable data set? I don't know, but this is what it, thank you, Jan, I concur. <laughs> it doesn't, I think it's a little bit too small of a sample size given that it's a huge, huge, huge country. And uh, immigration is a pretty imp Im um, impressive and important uh, topic. So regardless of this data, it's interesting, you know, are people wanting more immigrants or not? It can affect policy. And in an era of huh, public opinion poll politicking, <laughs> I just said that, um, you know, maybe this would have some impact on potential policies. I don't know that, and I'm just not suggesting it should, but I want to point something out, and this is a quote, the extraction migration economic strategy. So this is within the article, it talks a lot about this and what extraction migration economic strategy is and what it means and why it's important to you as real estate investors is because it is about expanding the nation's consumer economy with more cheap workers, high occupancy renters and government aided consumers. So these are, this is a strategy that some governments take, the extraction migration economic strategy. Canada, I would say is partially this, however, they've 
um, got it at a different level because they target more um, of the economic class immigrants. But this concept of high occupancy renters is very interesting, and those would be customers. So we just want to keep that in mind. Um, immigrants need homes and rental homes to start, so they could be potentially your tenants. And at a minimum, and again, this is an American policy, so not yeah, that it, strategy, I should say, economic strategy, is at minimum, they would increase the pool of potential clients, whether they're immigrants or specifically your tenants. In other words, it increases the demand for your total product, your rental market, and therefore your prices would be pushed upward, it would be easier to fill vacancies, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So um, it is neither a buy or sell, it's only FYI only, again, it's a very small sample pool, but what's interesting in that article is, is about that, that actual strategy, the extraction migration uh, economic strategy that could be truly fueling um, the rental market uh, and real estate market in the US. Now on the flip side in Canada, uh, this is an awesome infographic. I, they're just great. So way to go, Stats Canada. You did a good job. Immigration, I should say, um, Canada. Of you know, just showing some of this, the the data points and whatnot. Um, so whether you agree or not, immigration is good for real estate business. And why do I say that? Is because there's also a lot of debate on whether or not immigration is indeed good for business. And I or or the economy, I should say. Um, I'm not here to debate that or have that conversation, but it certainly is good for real estate business. Um, so more, because more people means more demand for a short supply and a place to live. So with low supply, all that puts upward pressure on prices. So that's all very important, but right back to this um, and just referring back to that political climate section. Again, I don't know if there's gonna be any impact. It may draw people to Canada even more. Um, so what we need to just be looking at is that net impact where if there's a decreasing population would there be downward pressure on rental and property markets yeah maybe but are we actually likely to see that no not very so again just stay tuned something to have in the backs of our minds so population on the whole i know that canada's targets are massive and i do actually i'm going to go back to this um there is a lot more to unpack in this particular um, thing. We have limited time, and last time I went two and a half hours, so I'm trying not to do that again for you this time. So this is in your um, weekly newsletter, and I actually unpack it quite a bit more, especially when it comes to the target. Please look at the target here of the 2022-2024 immigration levels. Um, so up to 451,000 in 2024. So pretty consecutively increasing. And like I mentioned also that 60% of admissions are in the economic class in Canada. Again, that's different than that extraction migration economic strategy that the US typically employs. So something just to keep in mind in terms of who your clients can potentially be. All right, inflation. I am not doing a deep dive on inflation. It is rising, rising, rising. We talked lots about it at all kinds of other research um, uh, labs. So that at the heart of it, as you, many of you know, at the heart of rising inflation is monetary policies that printed money, circulated it to individuals, and that is literally the only cause of real estate. Uh, sorry, <laughs> real estate of inflation. And I have much more to say about that for real estate investors. And I love, I think Hugh, you popped it in the chat about silver lining and opportunities. Here you go. This is a silver lining when it comes to inflation and all the scary stuff out there, what's going on. Real estate is one of the only assets that historically outpaces inflation and performs well during times of inflation. And so it is a big, big mitigator of risk and it's a hedge against mammoth inflations and all of these things. So this alone, despite everything else that I've even said today, even the political climate is a buy signal at this particular juncture. All right, it's definitely a hold signal. All right, so the Conference Board of Canada, rising prices stifle Canadians confidence. So the consumer confidence um, fell 7.6 points in February. Um, which is so saying that only 11% are positive about the current financial situation. That is not good. Uh, that is definitely below the pre-pandemic outlook. And I wanna read this um, quote from their report. Uh, 
Rising inflation further erode consumers' confidence as they spend less and save more. Falling real wages could also see households' confidence dwindle as they adjust their consumption habits to tackle inflation. So as inflation, what that means is as inflation takes hold even further and longer, Canadians will, I mean, it makes perfect sense, and Americans too, will tighten their purse strings, rightfully so. Um, eating beans instead of steak, this is, these are choices that people ultimately do at some point need to, to make. Um, and that further would entrench the inevitable recession. And that is unfortunately um, one of the only ways out of an inflation uh, scenario is to experience some form of a recession. Does it have to be a big one? No, but it will impact employment. That's typically the only way out other than of course interest rates. Uh, but that causes the same outcome. So um, real estate is one of the best assets. We've talked about that a lot, but I wanna give you that silver lining always. And then jumping into the rental market for the US in December, 2021, they're basically, they're up, they're up, they're up. Um, oh, I've got a really good one in just a second. Yeah, okay, so they're up. I'll go ahead. Why your rent is going up. This is fascinating. Okay, I know I'm jumping ahead. We know rents are going up, but in cities like Florida, they're like, you know, cities, I'm sorry, that's a state, but there's cities in Florida that are going up like upwards of 30%, et cetera, et cetera. Um, most are not, they're sort of saying 3.5 and 13%, it's kind of like the annual rent, rent growth, but this is cool. I did not know this. So most rent reports, apparently and i'm this is not gospel or anything like this i will definitely look into it further but apparently most rent reports don't include renewal rent rates which are lower right because if you're renewing typically you don't go in and get your brand new market rate you're only kind of raising it a little bit within market realities or within rent controls with whichever is available um or they don't include mom and pop properties so they have higher rent rates because it's not showing the renewals that are lower. It's not showing mom and pop properties. Um, and 60% of rentals in Canada, if not more, are mom and pop properties. So that's interesting. Whereas CPI data reports does include a survey of sample of renters from all kinds of buildings, asset types, including mom and pops and includes renewals. So there are lower rent rates. So that's interesting. So just in terms of how is that data captured. But regardless of the rent data, it is uh, where it's coming from and how it's you know curated, it is a hold signal. Um, this is definitely going in the right direction. Um, February of switching over to Canada, similarly, the average rent is up, 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 um, but, uh, annually as well as month over month. Um, I love this graph. <laughs> so I hope you do too. Um, what this is showing is the average rent for all property types by month from rentals.ca. Um, and it's according to their listings, by the way, so it's not everything, but it's an interesting, what we show for our real estate cycle formula is that typically rents are impacted about one year after an economic growth spurt will go up or a decline, they'll go down. Typically, that's approximate. And guess what we had, of course, in April 2020, we had the largest drop in GDP ever due to the government restrictions imposed due to the COVID-19 situation. And exactly one year later, the data points show, hey, it pretty much hit April 2021, all time low. Guess what? We started to see GDP starting to come up, some growth still not net net amazing positive growth, but getting into the right direction and starting to rise. So um, we are gaining back just about at towards, I should say, getting towards uh, pre pandemic rates uh, in terms of rent rates. So these are buy and hold signals. Um, this is good uh, that we're moving in the right trajectory and the economy and the leading indicators remain in place to show that for a long time. Moving into the property market. Um, and then this is in, so in Canada, the Toronto and surrounding areas need 30% more new housing units per year to meet demand. Uh, nothing new here. We definitely know that. Um, but we, um, it, it was an interesting study for sure. 
Um, demand continues to outstrip supply for U.S. real estate. Uh, same, same, same. So they're saying at this particular st uh, study, 26% um, year over year that inventory was down. So again, these are these are buy signals because when we've got an imbalance of supply and demand, and we want well, the, when we've got an imbalance of supply and demand, what will happen is that we'll put upper pressure on that property and those prices. So all in all, what it means is that home prices have nowhere to go but up. So then back to our conversation earlier about political climate and the questions of like Mark that you were asking of like, well, how much kind of could that even impact? And we don't know, but ultimately when it comes down to the supply and demand side of things and you add inflation, there's even gonna be more upward pressure on real estate. So um, for the foreseeable future. Now that said, again, so, yeah, Jennifer, go ahead. I'm mm -hmm. gonna jump in here just to clarify or ask a question. When I look at the data that you're presenting, it seems to me it's obvious that real estate is the best asset to get into at this time. Now, you mentioned um, consumer confidence. Is consumer confidence lower right now? Is it being driven by actual numbers or is it being driven by the narrative that kind of exists in the atmosphere? It's probably both. I mean, that would be the realistic answer. However, um, the, it's driven by actual numbers. So the, um, the dollar doesn't go as far. And like I said, individuals are making, and I, I, I come back to like steak or beans, but, these, but individuals are having to start making choices like that without the wage in, uh, inflation that's not keeping up with inflation. So your wages don't go as far as they used to. and the money you need more money to live and that impacts consumer confidence and it impacts i mean that that view of the of the stability and future finances of of canada and of the us really right now it's not very high so does that answer your question it does thank you awesome cool and whoop, whoop. Wait. Oh, there we are. So <laughs> we're almost at the end of this section. So our conclusions for our market analysis or macro market analysis for Canada and the US is that in Canada, we've got to just check out this political climate full stop. All of the other indicators, as previously mentioned, are still showing exactly what we're going to show in the US. I'll get to that in a moment. So notwithstanding that, it is a long-term expansionary period, slow, modest growth, with the exceptions of potentially a slight softening in 2023-2024 for inflation and for immigration impacts, potentially. Um, so it's a buy and hold. It's buy and hold or hold what you've got. So one way or another, that now is a great time to be in real estate and to keep your portfolio stocked. Um, watching how, back to Canada, other than that, because it's the same for Canada, except we just wanted to make sure that the perception of how the Emergencies Act is being navigated, how that plays out, and then we can fully determine if it has any impact on our real estate. So, thank you. <laughs> and now, Naran, any other questions? I see Spring, you asked about the 405 for Canada or the US. It was 451,000. Um, immigrants for Canada in 2024, and sub just a little bit less than that each year. So around 430,000, I think, for each year between now and then. That's that's a lot of information, Jennifer, and thank you. Um, you know, I, I was thinking to myself, while you grab a, a drink there, a well-deserved drink, uh, I was thinking that given that con consumer confidence is down, I think, again, it leverage, it allows us as people that provide housing to actually enter that conversation. So while rents are, are continuing to go up, if we were even to couch it that, uh, you know, we, we provide, um, say, um, LED lighting to, to so that the cost is less on the client, that those things like that, it actually enters the conversation that's already going on in their minds and sets us apart and at the same time provides real service in real time. 
I love that. I love that. Being really proactive and giving wonderful service to our clients while also solving their problems and ours. That is leadership. That is win-win. So thank you for sharing that, Naran. Really appreciate it. And I love that you said just have a drink. I just want to acknowledge this is water. And Jan, I would like to say a huge thank you for those beautiful gifts. I did not have a teacup at my hand and Jan actually sent me two beautiful teacups. So I will be able to have tequila in a teacup later on <laughs> or just tea. <laughs> but at any rate, so thank you. Really appreciate it. All right. So we will now get into um, the market analysis for Phoenix. So pop it in the chat. Who here is investing in Phoenix now? Interested in investing in Phoenix or would like, yeah, or would like to. So currently, or who, who doesn't care? Pop it in the chat. Phoenix folks, interested, right on, yes. Okay, great, okay. Interested in the conversation, let's, okay, yes, all right, let's go. All right, on it. <laughs> all right, so the GDP in Phoenix. Um, I, like, I can't wait till I get to the last slide of this, uh, of this presentation. So um, <laughs> Arizona was one of the best performing economies in the US during the pandemic, full stop. So it was up 3.2% net GDP. You can see that in 2020, US GDP was down 3.5%. Arizona only went down 0.9%. And its forecasted growth is, is it's already out, like well out of the hot water there. It was barely ever in it. So. Um, it, I mean, that is a major statement, one of the best performing economies in the US. Um, so, but that doesn't mean it's going to be going forward, but here's some fun news about maybe what will help support it. So, um, who watched the football, uh, the Super Bowl? Yeah, a few people, that was my birthday. And yes, I watched the Super Bowl on my birthday, but I recorded it and watched it later. Um, yeah, so the torch goes to Arizona for the Super Bowl next year, February 10th, 2023. Mark it on your calendars, go and visit because it's the fourth time and a Super 10 party. Yeah. Um, so, in, and this is their fourth time hosting the um, Super Bowl. So, in, we've got stats. So, 2008 Super Bowl produced 90,000 visitors and 500 million in Arizona, according to the, this article. 2015, 150K uh, of visitors, 150,000, pardon me, 720 million. And then 2023, it's expected to be an even bigger impact to boost local businesses. And as restrictions, government imposed restrictions are removed, I bet you there's even more people who are going to be wanting to go and party at that thing next year. Who knows? Time will tell. But as you know, I don't take anything at face value. And I happen to get to have one of my professors in my master's degree. Um, studied the Olympics and the impact of Olympics. So I'm a little skeptical of these kinds of numbers and I, apparently I'm not the only one. So an economist, uh, this is uh, Victor Matheson, he says the estimates of Super Bowl's impact are often exaggerated. So it might not be 720 mil, but he says that it's about maybe 30 to 130 million. And you know what? That's okay. It's still revenue. It's still generating something. And even if it's not so high, it's also definitely contributing to putting Arizona on the map. More people will be talking about it. There's certainly possibilities of short-term rentals to, you know, Super Bowl attendees. Other uh, long-term outlook is very positive. Forecast for the state economy projects solid growth. So um, the Arizona economy uh, should grow, led by Phoenix, by the way, Phoenix is the number one, which is important at the city level, is the number one city in uh, economic generator for Arizona, and it's growing at a solid pace. Um, and housing prices will avoid a uh, crash. Well, there's not going to be crash, but despite recent price surges. So there, it, there is nothing like that. Um, the economy, so this is Tucson.com. It says you've got this um, in your weekly newsletter. Uh, it's nine charts that show how the economy is performing in Tucson and Arizona. If you're interested, you'll definitely want to check these out. For ease of reference, I'm giving you a little like tip here so you don't have to look it up on Google if you don't know it. Phoenix is in Maricopa County and Tucson is in Pima County. So these, these are major graphs, <laughs> majorly interactive. I am not going to go through them, but you definitely have that link so you can do further diligence. And just check out what, how's Maricopa doing? 
it's very, very cool. So um, I'm highlighting that for you. This is one example of, um, of the data. So the person's not in the labor force who wants a job. It's updated regularly. Like that was just updated on February 5th, 2022. So keep a link to this. These stats are fantastic. Tons of data. It's mostly about jobs. Um, it's mostly about jobs. So there you are. But do check it out. Um, it's a ton of fun. Um, and now another headline, again, showing that the economy is poised for growth. Here's how Greater Phoenix Economic Council has helped Metro Phoenix economy flourish. So there's a whole group of, of uh, sorry, a whole article about what they've been up to. Well, guess what? At the end of the day, the Economic Council is sharing that they're very open for business and they are actively, and you want this as a political climate, you definitely want this in your market analysis so that you're going into great cities and they are actively attracting not only top tier e-commerce, but also people. And remember, go back to that, it was way back when, when we saw the inbound moves into all of those top states, Phoenix is number 18. So they're actually, so they're saying that they're doing this and they're having the, the right actions and the right results. So that's good. And that they're focusing on their fundamentals of attracting businesses. There's mega projects that are set up in the Metro Phoenix region, et cetera. So jobs. Um, oh, thanks spring. Take care. Um, get the recording in the, in the member portal. Um, so again, for jobs, similarly, Arizona, again, was one of the best performing uh, economies during the, the pandemic. So uh, it, it's recovered. It's recovered and surpassed pre-pandemic numbers. Um, so that's fantastic. And these are all, you'll see the buy signals. These are there's like buy signals on almost every single one of their metrics. In fact, all of them. So what's, uh, so under, so unemployment rate, um, you do want to see this going down. That's why it's down, but that doesn't mean it's a negative thing. It's an inverse relationship. So it's on the right trend. Let's put it that way. Um, what's interesting is that Phoenix has previously had its, you want to look for a diverse economy. And previously it was a little bit more based on construction and real estate. And this is now shifted even more so into science, technology, finance, healthcare, leisure, hospitality. The more the diversity, the better for definitely mitigating risk. So another buy signal. Um, the Arizona economy nears pre-pandemic norms um, as unemployment rates decline. So, okay, very good. Arizona operating at 97% of where it was in March 2020. Um, Arizona economy is ranked the fifth best in the nation. And Arizona is doing more than most states for job growth, 95,000 new jobs for 2021. These are all incredibly um, positive outlooks for the economy, uh, which means that it's good for your real estate. Um, uh, yeah, so you can see in this particular graph, we're really like in a very good situation. It's pointing to major recovery in jobs. If you can see this unemployment rate chart going down like that. So then when it comes to people, as I mentioned already, it's number 18 in terms of inbound moves, according to um, the Van Lines uh, report, but it's also been on other reports, the U-Haul report, et cetera. So there's no secret here that whichever company they're using, they're moving to Arizona. Check this out in terms of the 2021 population growth rate. U.S. was 0.1%. Arizona was 1.7%. And Phoenix outpaced them both at the national, sorry, at the state and the national level at 1.8%. In 2021, their total population reached 4.9 million, that's Metro Phoenix. Um, and that is good. You wanna be looking for, yeah, big cities like this that are affordable. I mean, it's just, this. these are all the right metrics, um, uh, all the right times. So um, there again, another article reiterating the, the data and, and whatnot in terms of its population growth and fifth largest by pop city population, et cetera. Um, it's, it, this is another fantastic um, graph showing the 10 fastest growing US cities. Um, so it, again, there's really, there's not much more to say other than the population is growing and it's one of the fastest in the US. Um, so revitalization. Oh yeah. Okay. So here I wanted to talk about this because I've looked at the real estate market in Phoenix. Um, I went and did some diligence there uh, specifically, I think it was last year. Yeah. It was last, last November or something like that. 
And I was looking at multifamily apartment buildings there and checking out the neighborhoods and, and doing my diligence as well. And freaking fantastic, fell in love with it. However, I had one question that I needed to find out for myself and it was water infrastructure. Oh, so it's just a little yellow flag that water is an incredibly important in like okay by the way phoenix has exceptional infrastructure like it is the best i've seen in any city in anywhere in the us i'm, I'm not kidding i was blown away by its infrastructure and it has i asked all the questions about water and they seemed to be answered appropriately i wasn't too concerned about it and then i saw that this article came out in february this year and Arizona is now enduring its worst ever water shortage. There's some, this isn't a local opinion, by the way, so, you know, but it is a high priority for a desert city to have those water issues and that there's some, some interesting things that are going on there. So I would want to like, it's not, it's not a red flag by any stretch because I am confident that in a city of 4.9 million people that they will definitely end with the infrastructure and the money and the influence and the businesses that they will certainly um, be able to you know ride this out and and uh, create a positive resolution for individuals so then um moving into the see so there's not all positive all the time you know gotta get in the, all the all the pieces here um so the rental market um so again, the, the rents are on the rise. It's one of the hottest rental markets in America. Uh, the landlords are market are soaring, vacancy rates low, um, the lowest it's been in 20 years at 3.8%. So again, all these metrics are pretty, pretty clear in terms of buy signals and moving in the right direction. Again, we wanna always base our judgments on our leading um, indicators, which are typically sort of uh, population or people moving in, um, jobs, economic activity, etc. So all of those are clear and and moving in the right direction because those push the prop the rental and property markets further down the line. So this is this is in for the long haul here, folks. Um, the rate of rising rent prices in Phoenix could suggest consumer changes. So um, again. <laughs> consumer changes as in people are moving to Phoenix. <laughs> so um, nationwide 10.1%, Phoenix saw an 18.8% increase. Phoenix degree of outperformance widened. So apparently uh, Phoenix has often outpaced national growth rent. So nothing new there, but the gap has certainly widened if you look at the orange line versus the blue line. And um, there's some sub markets. So because Phoenix is it's Metro Phoenix, and then there's, um, I've, I've actually, I curated a little list based on my experience and my diligence that I did on the ground in 2021. Um, and he'll note here that a couple of um, places are listed, Chandler, North Glendale, and Gilbert. That is from this article. Um, and I'm going to add to that, I think, on the next, very shortly, um, in, in this presentation. Um, now, when it comes to, here are the multifamily markets poised to outperform in 2022. Multifamily also. Phoenix is top of the list. Las Vegas, Tampa, Tucson, and Albuquerque. Um, so lots of growth there. That's looking good. And I want to, yep, what's in store for the Phoenix housing market? Strong streak. It's continuing to go. It's a seller's market for 2022. Buyers should be prepared for rising prices and bidding wars. And why? Because exactly all of the metrics, all of the leading indicators um, are, are in really good, um, good positions. And Phoenix sales activity. Let's see. So the sales are down 22.8%. This is the story that we're seeing everywhere is that sales are down. The sales are down because inventory. There isn't enough inventory. We've got a lack of supply and higher demand. So while this, so this is so unusual, but while sales are coming down, it's not normal indicator that there's no activity. It's simply that there is no activity or no demand for it. And so actually prices are going up while sales are coming down. So don't let these freak you out. It's, it, that's not it. But um, in terms of having multiple bids and whatnot, um, that is something to consider. Um, home values are up, rents up by 25%, et cetera, et cetera. Um, 
Uh, and again, I do go through this. I just want to start, acknowledge that I am going through this very quickly because I want to, you know, acknowledge that many of you, some of you are interested in Phoenix and whatnot. And this is a lot of data, but this is really for you to come back and you can use all this data, all the sources, whatever have you, and use them in your presentations with individuals that you may be, um, or in your market diligence, of course. So um, again, for sales, we're seeing sales up, 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 um, just generally speaking, all across the, 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 so, so the prices. So the actual sale number is down, the prices are going up. Inventory, month supplies, 1.28. I'm pretty sure I recall, and this is in Canada, but Christian, I think you were saying that um, the supply of inventory, someone else who could answer this, is like it's a normal supply, it should be like, between three to six months of inventory is a is a balanced market so 1.28 is extraordinarily low um, the arizona lawmakers introduced a bill to uh, improve housing affordability so they're going to be that's that's it's good they're going to be street why it's good <laughs> why it's good for real estate investors it is because they're going to be streamlining bureaucratic processes for building homes and that is great for investments for doing diligence for doing um, development as well and um and adding more supply. Now, I promised a little list of some Metro Phoenix cities to check out. Um, this is not exhaustive. There's lots of other great locations, and I have personally visited many of them. Um, Chandler is growing like crazy. North Glendale, Gilbert. Tempe. I don't know if that's how you pronounce it. Tempe. Tempe. Um, that's where the Arizona State University is, and really close to the airport, really close to major critical infrastructure, really close to downtown Phoenix. I was blown away. Oh, Tempe, Jan? Tempe? Okay. <laughs> Thanks. Um, and Mesa. Uh, there's lots. Of Scott, I mean, Scottsdale is fantastic. Probably many of you have heard about Scottsdale. However, it's already like pretty, it's, it's pretty developed. And it's, so there's always opportunity. Just do your diligence. These are not exhaustive, but I just wanted to give you some ideas of what to check out. And for the conclusion, for Phoenix, ladies and gentlemen, bringing it in for a landing. There. <laughs> That's it. That's all I've got for you. That's the biggest buy sign I could fit on this. Every single leading indicator and uh, lagging indicator. I see Natalia, you're smiling. <laughs> yeah, uh, exactly. So this is a great time to buy. It's a great time to hold. And um, there's definitely opportunity there for sure. And then in conclusion, just reiterating where we were for Canada and US, uh, buy and hold, long-term expansionary periods coming, slow, modest growth, and just have a little eye for what's going on for um, Canada. And again, please invite your friends, um, join us, help our community grow. I'm so delighted that Graham joined us tonight for the first time. Welcome to the community. And make sure you join our new, um, our next live events the second Wednesday, the third Wednesday, and the fourth Wednesday of the month. We've got some cool stuff. Um, actually, we're going to be following a little bit of a theme, excuse me, a theme this month. Um, so we just talked about the Phoenix markets, and now we're going to be bringing in a market leader from a Phoenix market. So how do we actually take action in Phoenix right now? That's what we'll be having, and then our community lab will be diving further into that so that we can take advantage of the market analysis. Now, if it said sell, we wouldn't be bringing on someone from Phoenix to, uh, or in the Phoenix market to talk about that. So um, definitely very exciting for, for folks to come and join us. And um, yeah, please reach out to us. And I'm going to open the lines um, for just any conversation that we may want to have with regard to Q&A, et cetera, et cetera. Um, Mark, you're asking for an average cap rate in multifamily in a standard neighborhood. I love that question. I have it on a spreadsheet and I don't remember it, but I definitely did a cap rate spreadsheet. I can pull it up if I can find it, but I can get it to you. <laughs> but I don't remember it off the top of my head from a year ago, sorry. Maybe someone else knows. All right. Well, thank you again, everyone. Um, Catherine, do good research on neighborhoods in Phoenix. Depending on the neighborhood, you may have much higher property taxes for things like, yeah, yeah, yep, yeah, very good. Um, 
do your neighborhood diligence for sure and uh definitely ask questions as well um eve question good questions about the emergency act only the government has the answer very interesting mm -hmm. well how do i want to respond to that maybe i'll just remind everyone that the government works for us I know that sometimes we may forget or whatever have you, and that may not be a popular belief, but it is. And ultimately, as they're politicians, so their business is politics. Their business isn't business. Their business is politics. Their business is being voted in and keeping their jobs. <laughs> they're very vested in keeping their jobs. So as a result, as Canadians, as citizens who vote, it is literally we can make a change and we can influence government to do what we what we want and you know a couple of questions that have been brought to my attention no actually i brought them to my own attention i'll be really straight up here is like where have referendums gone you know it's one thing to have opinion polls which there's no way to run a country but what about putting some of these things up for referendum, given that politicians are indeed about keeping their jobs and that's their focus. Therefore, we do have an influence. Um, and if we don't have an influence, then we can certainly have an ask for referendums. I remember having those lots when we were younger. Uh, who's going to Phoenix? <laughs> Sorry, go ahead and run. Jennifer, I was just going to say that I need to leave because I'm catching the red eye to Phoenix in a few minutes. Oh. <laughs> so, uh, right on. Okay. But, hey, guys. Oh, my gosh. Let's do it. Let's do a, like some sort of on site. I'd love to meet you in Phoenix. Who's okay? Who would like to do some form of like real estate summit, get together, bus tour? Yes. Bus tour. Anywhere in the US right now? Florida, Phoenix? I'm in. Pop it in the chat if that's something that's interesting to you. And, you know, maybe that's what we just got to do. Okay, well, I wouldn't have this ready for March 1st. Hey, guys, I know that we're the dream team for sure. But <laughs> so you can go to California, Allison, and then come meet us um, at another time. So Florida, yeah, I would love to. Texas, okay. Well, I think we have some marching orders. That would be fun. Thank you. <laughs> Yes, and Hawaii, of course, too. Um, but yeah, that would be great. Well, I will put that to the team. Hey, guys and gals. Yeah, it's about time that we get connected and hang out. And I'm a big fan of bus tours and getting our hands, you know, like seeing projects and getting a feel for the neighborhoods. And I mean, I learned so much just going to Phoenix last year and understanding how that market works and what's important to people and whatnot so um so you're not catching the red eye tonight naran <laughs> no but uh jennifer i do want to say in conclusion here uh, as we wind the call down a couple things one is that if you have some comments to make uh you know feel free not just to put it in the chat but we can bring you in i think jennifer into the into the call to have you can speak to us and to the group directly for those of you who are so bravely inclined the second thing is jennifer i'm every time like i'm always amazed at the amount of content that you bring and it's not just data it's extrapolated out into what does this mean for me as a real estate investor and a leader in my field and thank you for that 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 was that was a lot of information that was well articulated uh lastly I want to say that those of you who are in the room, I'm, I'm noticing in my conversations with some of you within this room and outside as well, that there's a lot of um, a lot of noise out there, and it is pulling and drawing our attention. Keep your focus, your eye on what is important. Keep your eye on what is crucial and what really, really matters. And that's done by looking at the actual data and by hanging out with people like you that are going to push your eye to what's crucial. Because when you do that, you get to turn up as different in, a, in, in this world as a leader in your field. And if ever leadership has been needed, it is now. So have a great week.
I, I just wanted to say that before you all took off on me. <laughs> no, that's very, very true. And, and actually, yeah, and to take it one step further, I mean, thank you for being a part of this community and as a rural member, and hopefully that can help to, to take it one step further, just like rely on us. Like we are going to provide you with a sense of, of, of reality and you can, you know, hopefully tune out some of the noise so that it frees up your brain. I will always, and we will as a team, always deliver the best that we can. And that's not to say don't do your other research and whatnot, but if this can be some something that you can lean on in this difficult time, like Naran said, focus your energy, um, do what you need to do. And we're, we've got you every week with our newsletter and we've got, and, and you can always send emails in and ask questions like, or on, on Facebook, holy crap, there are so many individuals. I know it doesn't look like there's a lot of people out there, but behind the scenes, people asking me questions and I'm, I do my very best to answer them and to tell what I know of any particular situation at a time. So hit me up, hit the rest of the team up. They're all there too. And we can get you through that. So I do want to be respectful of people's time. It is 9.05. I think that's the first time I did it in 90 minutes. <laughs> so I wanted to be respectful because I did go over so much last time. So I apologize. I made it in 90 minutes. If you do want to stick around for uh, conversation or if you want to stick around for um, q and I've got, I've got some time. So it's up to you. But the formal presentation is closed. So if you need to leave, that's just fine. Thank you. And my pleasure. Thanks, guys. If you do want to come in and you have a question to ask, just raise your hand. We'll see you. You can use one of the yeah. uh, actions to raise your hand. And can they unmute themselves? No. Oh. Can we... They raise their hand, and one of we we need to unmute. Oh. I see. Because I'd love to. If we can maybe get that going, that would be great. I know Vincent's got something to say. I can see it. And I see Duncan and Leanne are raising their hands. Perfect. Do I, do I have the power to just unmute everybody? Oh, there you go. There you hey, go. guys. Hello. Hello. How are you, Duncan and Leanne? Hey, yeah, good. Good, good, good. Um, we're actually, we're, we've been looking lately, doing some research on investing in the U.S. And one thing I've just been working on today was uh, mortgages, financing for Canadians down in the U.S. Right. Is anybody working on that right now? Yeah. Yeah. What do you mean by working on it? Know about it or working well, on making yeah, it easier? Because so it, <laughs> it's yeah, not easy. Yeah, 30 year mortgages, 30 year amortization with a fixed rate. And, and it's, it's just a whole lot to get into right off the bat. But I've been working on that lately. Yeah. Um, yeah. What is, what's your guys' experience? Have you guys been get, being able to get financing as a Canadian? Or have you had to open up a corporation to pull financing? Well, I love all these questions. All of the above. <laughs> the um, and I'll let other folks speak, but I'll speak to my experience is that um, the very first property I actually had to buy with, I bought it with a Canadian line of credit and I bought it cash. Quote unquote, I bought it cash because I have yeah, a yeah. credit in Canada. Um, and then subsequently I've been able to source, um, um, I had private financing for another one in the U.S. And then, but I had that in a corporation and then recently um, refinanced it under my personal name because they wouldn't even touch it with a corporation. Not, it wasn't good enough. It would be like a 40% loan to value or something. And as a Canadian, I think I only got, yeah, I know I was able to get up to an 80% loan to value, but it does change in terms of loan to, to values. But one thing I do want to mention, and you, I'd like to get the time to actually create a glossary of all the terms that are different in the US because there are plenty and what they mean and how they work. And because you're talking about the 30 year amortization and the fixed rate, I just wanna also mention that that can be really freaking amazing. So <laughs> one of the things that I love about American mortgages over Canadian mortgages, and my very first property was in Detroit, by the way, um, when I was 23. And how did I get that? I got a traditional mortgage and 
is my dad still on the line? So my dad and my stepmom lent me $10,000 and I got a, a mortgage in the US. And what I learned is that American mortgages are fixed at 30 years. They do not, and the term is 30 years, most of them, 25, 30, whatever you get. But the term is the same. So that means but you're locked in for the entire duration of that mortgage. That means that in five years from now or 10 years or whatever you lock in in Canada, you're not up for renewal. Mm -hmm. That helps yeah, when you're yours. done, you're done. When you're <laughs> one and done. And then I, and I think that that is, I mean, of course you can refinance and do things along the way, but if you don't want to, you don't have to. And I think that that kind of level of stability and sleep at night is fantastic and so actually a lot of people have been asking me questions and i appreciate them about like well what's mortgage rates going to do for the us like if they go up what's it going to do for the us market and one of my responses is nothing think about that if you literally can just pay your mortgage today for the rest of your life on all of your properties through cash flow or whatever have you then just don't sell them mm -hmm. <laughs> and it really wouldn't matter now, yes, it will impact individuals coming into them. I, I don't mean to sound flippant, but I'm, I'm only saying it in that way so that people could kind of get a different perspective of it is that it may not impact in a big way. Yes, new homeowners and buying and things like that. Yeah, mortgage or interest rates will be, you know, affect, affect that demand and affect the prices and stuff. But it also doesn't have to be such a major crisis if we put it in the context of this conversation. Yeah, no, it makes sense. And we're on, we're honestly looking at doing the same thing, setting up a line of credit in Canada and buying in cash and then and then seeing where it goes. Just the same as what, what you said, seeing if we can make it work in a corporation down there and, and working through the interest rate on the 30 year, if you can get it fixed, that's, that's great. Yeah, um, it may be worthwhile um, for you because you're just starting out in this process. And I just I'd love to offer if you want to connect with me privately as a rule advisor. Um, and then I can at least make sure you're going down the right path if you want. <laughs> yeah, sure. That'd be great. Okay. Awesome. Just uh, email info at realestatewealthlab.com and then we'll set up a, a Zoom. That and congratulations. Good. Take an action. <laughs> Anything else? Do you have any questions? I don't know. That was the one I was really curious about. That was the one yeah. on the top of the list for today. Thank Give you. Give someone else a chance. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Oh, oh, Allison, now everyone's asking. Oh, shit. Okay. I, you're right, Allison. That's fair. So, okay. So we need to do an event too, to walk through it. Uh, yeah. Okay. Well, we can do that. That doesn't still contact me, Duncan and Allison. We can talk about it too. I'm happy. Yeah. I'm, I'll hold that promise for sure. And we'll obviously dig into this even more. And especially now, isn't it? Interesting. Okay. Anybody else raise your hand or pop it in the chat to be unmuted for questions? Quiet bunch today. Oh, Lisa, how did you find private lenders to lend on a US property? Um, relationships. <laughs> just it wasn't it wasn't a private lender institution it was private money from yeah friends family that kind of thing now that said um no i'll leave it at that yep and your network is your net worth there you go allison yeah yeah um catherine when i was looking to buy in the usa i found different areas that had different lenders who are more friendly to canadians yeah. Yep. Um, and I actually don't, I mean, I know who I've been working with and that's worked with me, but um, I'm not saying that that's exclusive, but there, there's even others, but I have worked with um, RBC in the US. So there's RBC Canada and there's RBC US. Oh, Catherine. Okay. Unmute. There you go. Uh, um, we'll try to video on 
until it blows up at me. <laughs> trying, to buy, trying to buy something in Mexico. There's a company called CBI. They are a Canadian mortgage lender who lends internationally for Canadians, but they'll lend in Canadian dollars and it's at a lesser loan to value than you would get normally, but it is an option if you have some cash. Awesome. Thank you, Catherine. And we got to see your beautiful face for just a moment while you've got your Mexico internet. <laughs> yeah, so, it, it's starting to, to go out again. So bye. I'll, I'm still here, but no more video. <laughs> perfect. Can you um, pop that in the chat? I heard CBI. Um, oh, and Anita, you're putting it in there. So it's CBI, it looks like, in for, for that. Thanks. See, this is a great community. Look at that, <clears> already <throat> sharing. Um, Lisa, you're asking, do they have to be U.S. citizens? And I think that's with regard to CBI. <laughs> I'm not sure. Um, I think making a sort of coaching session on how to buy in the U.S. could be very be beneficial. And okay. All right. <laughs> I, uh, we're, hey, team, are we hearing this? All right. Okay. Got it. <laughs> Recorded. Roger. Yeah. And, you know, I'm going to actually reiterate, so I will, we, we will, but I'm reiterating something, so we can do that. Um, and I also want to reiterate something that we've been talking a lot about, and it's good to learn how to do it and know the ins and outs. And look at all the people who are freaking smart in this room, who all want to be investing in the U.S., who are all starting out, not all, but some starting out. How do we leverage that and work together? How do we collaborate, not compete? How do we, not that I'm suggesting that's even competition, but what about collaboration? And what about this concept of don't do it yourself? Like there, maybe there's, you know, a couple of people in this room focus, they focus on the US, da, 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 and then work together, collaborate. Don't do that yourself, but then you take your um, mm -hmm. expertise and then you share that. You know what I mean? Oh, well, Q, thank you. Jennifer, just so you're, CBI actually stands for cross-border investment. Ah, cool. Thank you, Catherine. You're welcome. And Naran. Cross, I'm writing that down. Border, cross-border what? Investment? Cross-border investment. And Catherine, if I've got the wrong CBI, just write the chat. Yeah, no, Mark, why are you joking? I'm starting on our read, joking, exactly. Well, there again, see, we've got, like, for example, at our last Market Leaders Lab with um, Aurelio, like, he's got that niche. So work with him on the REIT, unless you want to create one yourself or, or other REITs that are already up and running. And then, you know, work with just... There's so much for us to, to work with. It seems to be only for Mexican properties. Oh, Allison, you're already checking it out. <laughs> I think Catherine has her hand up again. Okay. Uh, go ahead, Catherine. Um, I also found out uh, in Mexico that um, if you're willing to put in time and build credit, like a year, so get a credit card, build up your credit in here. Uh, banks down here will lend to you. So everybody who says like, if you're going to the US or another country or whatever, and you can't get credit because you're a Canadian, it's not true. You just may have to put in time if you want more of a traditional mortgage. Um, otherwise, you do have to go other routes. Right. Thank you, Catherine. Look at all this in the trenches, international experience. Yeah. <laughs> The Great Refuge is a great refuge in some cases. There's been a lot of interesting migration trends these uh, these last few years. Two years. What other questions or any topics that you want to talk about? Do you need to get an ITIN, so a TIN number to build credit in the US? Mm, I don't know. I have a TIN. That's why I don't know the answer to that. Um, I, when I was 22, I was um, promote. I was working for Canadian Pacific Railway in Calgary, and they promoted me to work um, in in Detroit. And so I got an H1 visa, and that's how I got my TIN number. So 
it's always been I've been very blessed because that just makes everything easier. I'm like, ah, you got the tin. I'm like, I actually happen to have the tin. <laughs> Thank you. So I don't know the answer. Okay, well, we, what? Uh, go ahead and run. No, I was going to say, I believe we are at the end of our uh, event. And although we still have 40 people on this call, I think nobody wants to miss anything. I just in case. <laughs> <laughs> I know, right? So maybe what we could do is, um, well, we've got our community. Let so I, what I'm getting the sense is, is everybody wants like a group hug here. And so we've got our, our market leaders lab on the second Wednesday. Our community lab is going to be the following Wednesday. Remember the community lab is far more interactive. So um, we'll definitely have it set up if we can, um, uh, folks, the real estate wealth lab to make sure that we can have it. So everybody can be unmuted at their own leisure if possible. Um, that would be great. And we'll make sure that we try and take more time for Q&A. So, um, you know, depending on how things go so that we can have more conversations. You can make that commitment. Hey, Naren. That sounds great, Jennifer. That sounds awesome. Thank you very much, everybody. You've been an <laughs> excellent uh, listeners and participants and actor, act, action takers in this group. Yeah. Yeah, and thank you. I've actually just taken all of the chat notes and I'm going to go back and read through them. I do that after every call, by the way, um, to get your ideas, to get your information, like not your information, to get your ideas, to get your insights into what you want to see next. And then also, um, particularly for today, I just want to go back and get a litmus test of, you know, some of what your questions, the answers to the questions that I was post, uh, posing earlier with regard to political climate. So just remember the Real Estate Wealth Lab has your back always. Absolutely. And the those of you who live in the GTA, Toronto, Canada, if you live here, send me an email. Let's get together sometime at a pub or uh, something like that. Now the restaurants are open. Naran is our uh, designated extrovert. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> Believe it or not, I am not one, but I do love small groups of people. So there we are. And, and I love large groups of people. So <laughs> perfect. Okay. Well, well, yeah. Thank you, everyone, for joining us and take care. We'll be in touch very soon. Again, share this with your friends. Make money, become an ambassador, get your membership for free. You only need nine people, 10 people or something like that. I'm so bad at math in my head um, in order to get your membership basically paid for. So we're new and we're here for you and have a wonderful day. Bye everyone.